Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm David, Dr. David Reitzel here at Griffith Observatory, and with me is Patrick So. And also, we have a very special presentation from our very own observatory director, Dr. Edwin C. Krupp, about inhabiting the meridian, or inhabiting the meridian um, today. And we're going to be looking um, and talking about local noon and the autumnal equinox, which happens today. In fact, the moment of equinox is coming up in just a moment. Um, today, we're going to be observing the equinox with Griffith Observatory, and I literally mean with the building. We have instruments that are public instruments that you can come on up on days we're open and observe what's called local solar noon. And what local solar noon is, it's like that high noon you'd hear about in the Westerns, like in this Gary Cooper movie here, uh, the cowboys would get together and say, I'll meet you at high noon. Well, they, what they were talking about is the moment of solar noon. And the idea of a solar noon is a moment in time where the sun is as high in the sky as it will get for you. Now, this does not always happen at clock noon. Clock noon is a moment that's defined by a precision timekeeping. We want to have timekeeping that moves very smoothly. Everything is even. Um, well, it's at least within certain time zones. We've divided the Earth up into these strips where everybody within that entire strip has the same time. Now, of course, the sun's not overhead for all those folks at exactly the same moment in time. It happens at different times. So here in Los Angeles, it'll be at a different time than it is in San Francisco, a different time than it is in Las Vegas. I think you get my, get my point here. So we are going to celebrate this moment of local solar noon at Griffith Observatory. Now, do not look at the sun unless you have the right kind of glasses. Um, those are solar glasses, eclipse glasses. They're not 3D glasses like this several stacked sunglasses, that is not good enough, but you can observe the moment of local noon with our meridian arc in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor here at Griffith Observatory. This instrument is designed to do exactly that, and you're going to be able to experience that today on this live stream, so stay tuned for that. And you're gonna hear more about instruments like this from our very own observatory director in just a few minutes here. Um, tonight, by the way, we will also celebrate the moment of sunset. So you wanna make sure to tune in tonight at, uh, it, our broadcast starts tonight at 6.30, Patrick, is that correct? That, that, that I is wanted correct. to make sure I had that time correct in my notes. Yeah. I closed my note file. Um, so you wanna make sure you come back tonight and see the sunset along our sunset lines. Now, why is all of this plottable? Why can we make instruments that measure these things? Why can we make lines on the ground that predict where the sun is going to set? It's all because the reason we have seasons, the reason the sun goes higher and lower in the sky is because the Earth's axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees. It's currently pointed very close to the star Polaris, the pole star. And as the Earth orbits the sun, that axis maintains the same direction. It doesn't tilt, it doesn't wobble around. It does a little bit, but it takes thousands of years to make a full wobble, um, tens of thousands of years actually. So year to year, that wobble isn't much. It's pointing the same direction, which means sometimes the sunlight falls directly on the Earth, like on the moment of spring and autumn. Today, that is the Northern Hemisphere autumn. autumn. Um, sometimes it falls more directly in the Northern Hemisphere. The moment of sun, summer, you can see, in fact, if you were up in the pole, you'd be getting constant sunlight. You get the, the land of the midnight sun. Of course, in winter, the North Pole is in constant darkness because the sunlight's falling in the south. Now, let me do some quick images here to show you what I'm talking about, a side view of the Earth. This would be the first day of winter for the Northern Hemisphere or the first day of summer for the Southern Hemisphere. This happens on December 21st, usually. This is what we're experiencing today, a moment more like this, where the sunlight is even. It's neither concentrated on the North nor concentrated on the South. This is a moment of Northern Hemisphere summer. Again, the rays are falling more directly in the north and are more spread out in the south. Now, is there a picture of this? Sure thing. Here is an image of the Earth or a series of images stitched together into a little movie and you can see that pattern of sunlight as it's more concentrated in the south. Now it's more concentrated in the north. You can see Africa there, by the way, it's centered on the Middle East and there it's ending close to the moment of equinox again. We come along here are those same image, well, not the same images, different color images from a satellite, but the same effect where you can see in the upper left corner is a moment of equinox. The upper right corner is the moment of summer solstice for the Northern hemisphere. 
the left lower is another equinox and the lower right is the moment of winter for the Northern hemisphere. It's the first day of summer for the Southern hemisphere. Now there is some confusion by some folks that this is summer and winter are caused by a relative distance to the sun. Some folks think we're closer in the summer for the Northern hemisphere. Well, it's, it's not the case. You can see the earth is closer to the sun on January 3rd. And then when we get all the way back around to June 21st, we're actually moving away from the sun. And then on July 3rd, we're furthest from the sun. And then when we get back around to a day like today that plotted the 23rd of September, but 22nd is right before then, you can see we're on our way back getting closer to the sun, but our weather will start to get cooler here in the Northern hemisphere. It'll get warmer in the Southern hemisphere. Now, Patrick, um, what is this gonna look like in sky? What, what's that happening up there? Okay, well, we'll turn to this um, uh, graphic here. And there we go. And uh, so um, the moment of um, auto autumnal equinox uh, will occur at 1221, which is roughly about 15 minutes from now. We only have 15 minutes of summer left here uh, before the sun, as you can see in this diagram, uh, crosses that blue line, which is known as the celestial equator. If you can imagine, it's the Earth's equator projected into the sky. Now, the sun has an annual apparent path across the sky, which is uh, known as the ecliptic, and it moves along in this direction. So the moment of equinox, it's right on the equator, that blue line, and then after that, the sun begins to drift below that line and uh, moves along the, uh, the ecliptic. Uh, which is basically caused by the Earth's motion around the sun. As we go around the sun, it looks like the sun goes around the sky and it enters the southern sky. And from there on, it, it goes all the way um, south until it reaches a point uh, known as the winter solstice, uh, which occurs in December. And uh, so that's one uh, moment to, uh, to celebrate uh, the last minutes of summer. And the next thing we will be uh, celebrating will be the local noon when the sun reaches that uh, line that runs north-south known as the meridian, the, the line that runs straight up there. And that's the moment where the sun is uh, highest in the sky as seen from Los Angeles. It would be about 56 degrees above the uh, uh, due south horizon. So uh, we'll be doing a ceremony on that. And uh, back to you, David. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, so folks, don't look up in the sky to see this effect with your own eyes, unless you have a pair of eclipse glasses or a device that is designed to observe the sun. It is not safe to look up at the sun, even with sunglasses, like I said, just don't do it. But we do have an instrument here at Griffith Observatory that can observe the moment of local solar noon. And our very own observatory director, Dr. Edwin C. Krupp is going to tell us all about that right now. Um, Dr. Krupp, are you there to tell us about inhabiting the meridian? Thank you very much, Dr. Reitzel and, and uh, Patrick as well. And, uh, and of course I am, and I wanna thank everyone for tuning in today uh, to Griffith Observatory Television and, and observing the autumnal or fall equinox. And in particular, as you both said, uh, a short time from now, uh, local noon in Griffith Observatory's Gottlieb Transit Corridor. The, um, the, the schedule really calls for us to spend a, a, a little uh, quality time with the meridian, uh, which is inextricably linked with local noon. And, and as you've mentioned, we'll be doing that in, in just a, a short time. And in the midst of all of this, as uh, you've already been informed, the exact moment of equinox uh, occurs during this program, just a few minutes from now. Well, the meridian, of course, is, is a fundamental reference in our system of directions. Uh, it is just the line that runs on the ground from true north to true south. And wherever you go, there you are on some local meridian, uh, wherever it may happen to be. Uh, many monumental antiquities were intentionally aligned with it. And actually our maps are oriented by the meridian uh, with the general convention of north, south, and east and west. There's a map there of just Washington, DC, the District of Columbia, uh, which was laid out according to those cardinal directions, which are in fact defined by the meridian. Uh, and of course the grid plans of many major cities are built to it. There's just the, the plan of Chicago on the shore of Lake Michigan, 
uh, but all of its streets are uh, designed to run north, south, east, west, and so oriented to the meridian. And in fact, the design of Griffith Observatory adheres uh, to the cardinal directions and the local meridian. Well, the meridian originates in the basic behavior of the sky, and it's a fundamental uh, astronomical reference. It's probably most familiar to most people as the, the prime meridian at Greenwich, England. And the Greenwich meridian serves as the adopted zero point for longitude on Earth. It's a primary attraction at the old Royal Observatory at Greenwich. It's marked on the ground there. People stand on the meridian. People sit on the meridian, and of course people observe on the meridian. So the meridian then is a north-south line, and we identify those directions north-south uh, through the most fundamental motion of the sky, its daily rotation, and thanks then to the spin of the Earth on its axis, the entire sky seems to turn around a single unmoving spot in the sky, the north celestial pole at the center of this time-lapse image of the stars moving around the north celestial pole as the night progresses. And of course, Polaris, the pole star, or the north star, is fortuitously close to that position. And it's called the north star just because it's in that direction. So the direction on the ground directly below the north celestial pole is north. That's in fact where the direction north originates. We wouldn't even be talking about north like this if it weren't for this motion of the earth, if the world did not turn. But of course the world turns and as the world turns, uh, the sky then delivers these directions on which we depend to orient ourselves. As the sky rotates around the north celestial pole, the objects in the sky, the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, they all cross or transit the meridian. And, and in its view of the, uh, the Earth, in a sense, in space, it's sort of treated here as a, sort of in a, a bubble, as antiquity would have imagined it, with the sky overhead. But you're seeing the sun, in this view, rise on the east side of the celestial sphere, cross the meridian at its highest point, and then set in the west. And that transit, then, for any celestial object, is just at the summit or the top of its arc across the sky in that particular 24-hour cycle. Uh, the word meridian is rooted in the words that mean midday or noon. When the sun transits the meridian, it is then local noon. When the sun is east of the meridian, it is anti-meridium or a.m., that is before midday. When the sun is west of the meridian, it is post-meridium or p.m., after midday. And just for the record, people speak about 12 noon and 12 midnight, but sometimes say 12 a.m. or 12 p.m. There is no such thing as 12 a.m. or 12 p.m. So it's always 12 noon or 12 midnight. Uh, when the, the sun is on the meridian, it's on the meridian. It's not either before or after. So the meridian then is a time and a place and a direction. And the meridian is also that celestial arc that vaults the sky from the north point of the horizon through the zenith directly overhead to the south point on the horizon. And every month, astronomy magazines like Sky and Telescope publish an all-sky map equipped with a celestial meridian. It's just the vertical line that runs down through the center of this map. And it bisects it uh, from uh, north to south with the zenith at the, uh, the chart center. So from the surface of the Earth, the distinction between north and south is profound. The stars travel then, as we've seen, in circles around the north celestial pole, if you watch them over time. Looking to the south, the, the stars seem to follow longer trajectories, flatter trajectories. They're still moving in circles, but the circles from our perspective are much larger and therefore seem flatter from here we are on the Earth. But anybody watching the sky and seeing how it behaves behaves would notice this profound difference between looking in one direction or the other and then adding meaning to that from which our direction system emerges. So the, the fact is uh, our ancestors really were aware of these directional distinctions and our ongoing use of them is, is really just a perpetuation of old habits. Evidence of these habits shows up in many ancient prehistoric sites. And so, for example, a natural rock shelter uh, in Ventura County in Southern California, which is, we're looking out, out the, the entrance to it now. Inside, it's enriched with Chumash pictographs. And this place seems to have been chosen for this symbolic enhancement 
because by chance it opens due north and the slope of the ceiling permits a view of the northern sky and the celestial pole. When you're inside there at night and looking out, your view is framed by the entrance to the shelter and it frames as well the northern part of the sky centered, in fact, on the north celestial pole. And the spirit creatures painted up above on the ceiling seem to be following it out of the shelter on an upward slant toward the north pole of the sky, a destination of supernatural shamanic power in, in Chumash tradition. The same principle is deliberately expressed in monumental architecture in Chaco Canyon in northwest New Mexico. Uh, Pueblo Bonito, a large multi-story apartment complex, is oriented with the meridian and it, it commemorates its orientation uh, in a north-south wall that splits the, the entire structure in half. And in fact, you can even see the remnants of that north-south wall, uh, putting one of those big kivas on one side of it and another one of those subterranean ceremonial chambers or kivas on the other, all on that north-south line. Beijing in the People's Republic of China is really the only world capital that still adheres to an ancient sacred cosmological plan. During the Ming Dynasty, it was laid out on a meridian, a north-south line that's been preserved even by the current regime. It's apparent in the ritual walkway of the Imperial Palace. It's a plan of the Imperial Palace there, uh, but there's the walkway. And this line was focused on the emperor who held court at the Hall of Supreme Harmony, which you're seeing at the end of the walkway there. He was the sky's agent on earth and the terrestrial counterpart to the North Celestial Pole. Just as all the stars circumambulated around the North Pole of the sky, the visible face of the high god Shangdi the court circulated around the emperor. Now, Egypt's great pyramid at Giza and the rest of Egypt's pyramids are cardinally oriented as well. And by incorporating cosmic order into monumental architecture like this, the Egyptians miniaturized the cosmos in a terrestrial setting and thereby transformed it into sacred space. That it is in fact, a kind of the original character and definition of sacred space, that it coordinates the order of the cosmos with circumstances here on earth. The observatory of Guoshou Jing, a 13th century Chinese astronomer at Gaocheng in North Central China, operates like a, a giant sundial to establish and refine the calendar with shadows cast on a long meridian wall. In the diagram, you can see a high sun casting uh, its it shadow very short uh, at the bottom. And then at the, the low sun in winter, uh, the shadow is very long and extends out that wall, which in fact is visible from up top of the tower and, and looking out uh, uh, to the north in that view. These principles were all applied more elaborately in the 14th century by Islamic astronomer and ruler Ulug Beg at Samarkand in what is now Uzbekistan in Central Asia. It appears there on a postage stamp from, from Uzbekistan. And he put an arc on his meridian uh, and some remnants of that arc that were underground still survive um, in Samarkand today. And he created that. There's the other view looking in the other direction on the surviving portion of the arc, uh, but he did that in order to observe transits of the sun and other objects on behalf of timekeeping, calendrics, and star mapping. And in this particular view, a beam of sunlight is falling on the arc inside that chamber and being measured on the scales that are inscribed in that arc. Well, Europe developed its own calendrical revelations in architecture with giant meridian scales that were installed in churches. And this is just a diagram of one of those, a large tower in a sense, uh, with a hole up at the top that permits the sun to shine through and cast a shadow. And at various times of the year, depending on the height of the sun at noon at that time of year, you would get a different length of shadow and be able then to know and measure that time of the year. Uh, these were at first intended to measure the, the progress of the year calendrically, but these meridianas were eventually inscribed on church floors by astronomers for precise measurements of the sun's daily noon elevation. An aperture on a vertical wall rising beyond the south end of that calibrated meridian line then permits that pinhole image to 
of the sun to cross the meridian each day at local noon, put a spot of sunlight there. And where that spot intercepts the line uh, depends, of course, on the sun's uh, local noon uh, elevation. Well, Dante's San Petronio Meridiana, as shown in this illustration, was never completed, and it was replaced in 1655 by a grander Meridiana uh, designed by the astronomer Gian Domenico Cassini. Cassini's 220-foot meridian is still embedded in the cathedral's stone floor in Bologna. And here, in fact, uh, is uh, the view looking up towards the aperture that comes through the wall. There's the view looking in the opposite direction where the spot of sunlight will be projected. And there, in fact, is the spot of sunlight as it was projected, crossing the meridian line for the measurement to be made on the 18th of November in 2004. Here, just for another example, is a meridiana in the old part of uh, the upper part of Bergamo in northern Italy, and it's operating like clockwork on the 14th of October in 2009. Of course, formal observations of the sun's meridian transits persisted in, in national observatories like the Paris Observatory, uh, the cornerstone of which was laid on the summer solstice in 1667 during the reign of Louis XIV. And France adopted the axis of the Paris Observatory as its preferred primary meridian. Jean-Dominique Cassini was invited to Paris to assist development of the new Paris Observatory. He became the first director in extending the inquiry he had undertaken at San Petronio. He, had, he constructed a large meridiana in the Great Hall on the second floor of the Paris Observatory. It's 96 feet, 10 inches long. He wanted the building to perform as an instrument and he designed his meridiana to coincide with the meridian of France, which just continues and is marked on the lawns and pavements as it extends from the Paris Observatory. With it, he planned to obtain a more precise determination of the apparent annual motion of the sun. Well, despite the French preference for a French prime meridian, the local Greenwich meridian occupied by George Airy's transit circle, you see that circle there, was officially adopted as the prime meridian of the world in October uh, 1884 at the International Meridian Conference held in Washington, DC. Airy was England's astronomer royal and his transit circle at the Greenwich Observatory, still in place, was used in the service of British cartography. The old Royal Observatory had been established in 1675 by King Charles II, who wanted it dedicated, quote, to finding out the longitude of places for perfecting navigation and astronomy, very much the motivation for most national observatories. But long before England and France drew a line in the land for zero degrees longitude, astronomy in medieval India staked out a prime meridian claim of their own through Ujjain, which is about 400 miles south of New Delhi. You can see the plan of the observatory established there. It's in central India, and it was believed to occupy the Tropic of Cancer. And that in part accounts for its status. The, uh, that's the latitude uh, where the crossing of the sun occurs at summer solstice. Well, so why Jai Singh II, the Rajput ruler of Jaipur in India, built Ujjain in 1730, and four more monumental observatories. His most elaborate observatory is at Jaipur. You see one of the monumental architectural instruments there. Uh, there, the, the great Samrat Yantra makes sculpture and architecture out of an instrument. It includes a particularly interesting component. Uh, this doorway leads to a special room, a cardinally oriented room, that houses a pair of inscribed quadrants circles uh, of uh, uh, arc that are inscribed uh, with angles and permits light from the transiting sun at local noon to enter the darkened chamber. You can look in this view and see the little hole up in the distance where the sunlight is coming through and it's glancing off the side wall uh, at the moment. In fact, there's a pair of those small holes uh, that allow sunlight to enter the chamber and fall then ultimately on the two separate arcs inside that room. Those spots project pinhole images of the sun onto the two quadrants and therefore project a direct observation of the astronomical declination, which is in fact then linked to the calendar and the progress of the year. Well, there are all kinds of meridians around the world, but anyone who collects meridian markers now must navigate a course to Los Angeles. Everybody knows about the Greenwich Meridian, of course, uh, but this here, in fact, is the Griffith Meridian. Griffith Observatory is cardinally oriented. It 
faces north and its telescopes are aligned with the north celestial pole uh, and uh, they uh, facilitate then continuous tracking of celestial objects. And although the Griffith Observatory was conceived and constructed to conform to the needs of modern public astronomy, its Greek revival, Beaux-Arts, modern architecture actually reflects the traditional vision of, of cosmic order. Telescopes operate on this principle. Uh, the telescope is rotated around its polar axis at a rate that compensates for the turning Earth. The sundial is also aligned with the meridian and that permits its shadows to convey time systematically. And the mirrors of Griffith Observatory's triple beam celestat or solar telescope are also on the meridian. Well, the Griffith Meridian is actually part of a singular and monumental public instrument, the Gottlieb Transit Corridor. There's really nothing else like it anywhere else in the world. This instrument's integrated into the observatory's new architecture on the west side, where parallel glass walls, 150 feet long, 20 feet high, preserve below grade the observatory's signature western horizon. And this instrument demonstrates how the sky works through meridian transits of the sun, moon and stars over that walled corridor. The corridor 10 feet wide is bisected by the bronze meridian line set into the concrete floor. And it extends the full length of the walls which frame the celestial meridian even in the sky. If you look up there, you see a kind of a wide ribbon of sky that's the celestial meridian. And it extends the full length of the walls then to turn this astronomical abstraction into a visual experience. The architecture reveals the astronomy. At the north end, the meridian line climbs up the stairway constructed to ascend at the angle of the north celestial pole. At night, visitors can actually sight the North Star along the stairway central banister. And the fundamental character of Griffith Observatory is indicated then right there on the front of the building where the bronze letters declare Griffith Observatory. It's an observatory and it puts visitors eyeball to the universe. Griffith Observatory is a public observatory and the building is filled with instruments. All of them deliver real data and real experiences and transform visitors into observers of nature and the sky through the instrument. So we're mobilized by the concept of the building as instrument. The Gottlieb Transit Corridor is just another dimension of that immersive encounter with the sky. And there's more to it than that long glass corridor, the North Stairway and the bronze meridian line. At the south end, a tall and, and night black monolith a, supports a, a, a stainless steel foil. And on the ground, just north of that monolith, stands that uh, uh, bronze and, and stain, stainless steel uh, meridian arc. And above it on the inside face of the glass wall is mounted a huge and uh, heavy ecliptic chart, a chart of the stars and the path of the sun as it moves through them over the course of the year. Well, the foil attached to the monolith, that, that angled piece of metal up at top of the, the black monolith is equipped with a complicated and, and technically advanced device a hole. An object, say the sun, transits the corridors, its, its light path passes through the hole, and where that light falls depends on the angle the object makes with the horizon, and an object reaches its highest elevation when it transits, as you've already seen. So the monolith and the foil permit light from the transiting sun to strike the meridian arc, and where the, the sun's image, about three images in diameter, hits, it announces the date on the scale, which is inscribed with months and days and the corresponding ecliptic constellation figures and special emblems on the arc, uh, spotlight the solstices, the equinoxes and the major standstills of the moon. People walk inside the transit corridor. They watch all this. They also watch from the terrace above. Now, actually, Tycho Brahe already did something like this. In 1582, he fabricated and installed a large bronze engraved meridian arc for transit observations in Uraniborg, the castle observatory he built on the island of Ben off Denmark. Uh, that I'm afraid is long gone, but we do know from his, uh, his written uh, re records of what he did and the illustrations he provided uh, that these kinds of instruments were uh, constructed and used by him. Well, the monolith and the foil at Griffith Observatory permit light from the transiting sun uh, to strike the meridian arc where the sun's image then about three inches in diameter as we've seen announces the, the, the date on that arc depending on where it falls. And the uh, 
uh, date is is marked as as we've already seen by the inscribed ark, and then people continue to to move through it. Well, we have, uh, however, in this case, linked that meridian arc where the sun makes its daily noon transit with the big star chart up on the wall. And as the sun's light reaches the, the center line of the meridian arc, it first it hits the edge and then gradually moves a little closer and closer to the center. And then finally it crosses the center line where there are sensors running the length of the arc. And when that sunlight actually hits those centers, they transmit a signal to the giant ecliptic uh, chart up above. And that signal prompts the illumination of lights that mark the current position of the sun along the ecliptic. It shows the stars that are with the sun in the daytime, even those, in fact, those stars cannot be seen uh, because it's bright daylight when you look in the sky, but the ecliptic chart documents and demonstrates what's up there and where they are. <clears throat> so the meridian is a place and a time and a direction. And when visitors arrive at this junction of earth and sky, they occupy a place where space begins. It's, it's kind of a cosmic modem that downloads the sky. They connect what happens in the sky with place, time, and direction here on Earth in a dramatic and a precise and a content-rich revelation in light. The meridian is not then just an instrument or a concept. It's a stage and the universe performs on it daily and I'm about to leave interior space at Griffith Observatory to head out to the Gottlieb Transit Corridor now, where I'll join you in a moment. Well, thank you very much for that, Dr. Krupp. Um, you've enlightened us all about what these meridians are, what uh, local noon is, and where these are observed, and how this has been observed throughout time. Um, absolutely fascinating to see that our very own instrument here at Griffith Observatory is just one of many. It's in a long line of instruments. Um, we certainly have a modern twist with those sensors that are in the middle that light up the position of the sun on that ecliptic chart. But um, nonetheless, the concepts that go into making this work are exactly the same as what was making it work in cathedrals hundreds of years ago and in other observatories throughout time. Patrick, have you ever been to a, another meridian arc? Have you been to the Greenwich Meridian? You know, um, I have not. I, I know other. Uh, uh, I, I know other people have been there and and seen that uh, that grand line uh, that that is so famous uh, for uh, kind of dividing the world time zones. But but it is uh, something that uh, if if um, you happen to to visit uh, the uh, Greenwich Observatory, it's definitely something to uh, take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're in Los Angeles, be sure to come to Griffith Observatory and visit the Griffith Meridian. And if you come at local solar noon, you can see our very own Meridian Arc in action from the Gottlieb Transit Corridor. Um, I'm going to take a moment here to let you know this. Today's presentation is brought to you by Griffith Observatory, of course. We are owned and operated by the City of Los Angeles. And also, we'd like to thank our nonprofit partner, Griffith Observatory Foundation, and we appreciate all of you that have joined the foundation and have made donations that make programs like this one possible to everybody. So I'm looking at the chat here. It seems like people are enjoying today. I'm not seeing any questions in our chat that we can answer right now as we wait for Dr. Krupp to make his way down to the transit corridor. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what that ecliptic chart is really showing you. Everybody sees that curvy line that is up on our ecliptic chart. I'm going to get the laser pointer here out, but you can see this curving path. That's actually the path that the sun appears to take in the sky as the earth revolves around the sun. So as we all know, the earth orbits the sun. It takes one year to do so. And as the earth makes its way around the sun, the direction that sunlight is coming from in space is changing. So literally, sometimes we can see the stars in one direction at night, and then six months later, we're looking at stars in the other direction of light, the other direction in the sky. So that means that the sun, of course, has to travel. So you're watching the path here. Here it is in one half of the sky, and then we wait, come along, and all of a sudden, there is 180 degrees. That's the opposite direction of the sky. But why is it making a wiggle up and down? Why is it making a wave? 
That has to do with the tilt of the Earth's axis, of course. The axis of um, the Earth and the way we orbit of the sun, the two of them are tilted. If the Earth's axis was not tilted with respect to our orbital plane, this sine wave that you're seeing here, the, the path that the sun takes in the sky, would fall along what we call the celestial equator. And it doesn't do that because of that tilt. So this causes all the effects of season. I thought I heard something from uh, the, the transit corridor down there. I'm trying to... Perfect. Well, I just got word indeed that Dr. Krupp is ready for us down in the transit corridor. So we're going to turn it over to him right now. So Dr. Crump, back to you from the Gottlieb Transit Corridor here at Griffith Observatory. It's, uh, it's, gonna, it's 10 minutes before local noon. They can keep vamping. It's, it's okay with me. Through the magic of Griffith Observatory Television, I have managed to transfer myself from my office inside Griffith Observatory out here to the Gottlieb Transit Corridor in the hope of providing a demonstration of local noon at Griffith Observatory. Uh, the fact is, uh, we've got some unanticipated an extra drama, uh, making this a far more theatrical presentation than we would normally intend. There are clouds in the sky over Los Angeles today, spotted clouds, and they could in fact interfere uh, with the actual performance of the instrument. Uh, but if that, uh, that occurs, I will uh, of course uh, act as though everything is completely normal no matter what. But we are in the Gottlieb Transit Corridor, and that, that kind of deserves a slightly greater explanation, uh, Gottlieb Transit Corridor. Well, Gottlieb is pretty straightforward. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, the, the name of Robert and Suzanne Gottlieb, major benefactors to Griffith Observatory during the renovation and expansion that uh, allowed Griffith Observatory to be renewed and expanded and reopened uh, in 2006. And so this monumental instrument incorporated right into the architecture of the observatory uh, is, is named after them. Uh, corridor is pretty straightforward as well. Uh, if you take a, a wide angle look at this space, it, it's got two walls, two glass walls. One in fact is, encloses the cafe at the end of the universe and the other is just a freestanding wall to the west of it. And together they create a corridor that runs along uh, the Griffith Meridian. And as I, I mentioned earlier, uh, everybody's heard of the Greenwich Meridian, of course, but I'm not so sure that everybody knows about the Griffith Meridian. But it's right here. This is the Griffith Meridian. And, and in fact, uh, it's a working meridian that extends all the way from the south end of the transit corridor uh, to the far north end and the stairway at the far north end, where the banister and the stairway continue up at the angle that will carry your eye directly to the north pole of the sky and the north star. The sky seems to turn around that north star because the earth is turning, rotating in space, and that leads us then to that third word, transit. Now in astronomy, transit has several different meanings, but here in the transit corridor, the meaning of transit refers to the passage of a celestial object over the north-south line or the meridian. Objects, of course, rise on the eastern part of the sky from the horizon on the east and they arc over our heads and then set in the west. And at their highest points, each 24-hour cycle, they are said to transit. And when the sun transit, that is said to be local noon. Well, that's what we're observing is the sun transiting our local meridian at local noon, but the fact is, anybody here in Los Angeles taking a, a, a look at the, the clock right now will say, well, it's nowhere near uh, 12 noon, and in fact, that's, that's exactly so. Local noon does not necessarily coincide with the time on the clock when the big hand and the little hand in the old days were up to the 12. Now you just see numbers, of course, and, and nobody knows where the hands on the clock happen to be, but nonetheless, everybody kind of knows that at 12 that is noon not the sun the sun's operating on its own time it's uh, actually also operating on its own time right here in the transit corridor because the monolith that is to the south of us has attached to it up at the top a huge angled piece of metal with that very advanced 
and hard to understand piece of technology in it, a hole. And the hole allows sunlight to fall through it and come down and hit the pavement here and ultimately the meridian arc. I can see the shadow of the, uh, at the monolith and the foil on the ground just to the north of me here and that uh, spot of sunlight uh, of the sun edging ever closer toward the meridian arc where we are waiting to have the meridian and local noon occur. But this difference between local noon and the, the, the clock time noon uh, it has to be explained and it's really pretty straightforward. Uh, it begins first of course with the fact that uh, our clocks don't keep time exactly by the sun. Our clocks keep time uh, by time zones for one thing. Uh, we have divided the earth into 24 time zones. We're in the Pacific time zone and that means that any place in that time zone will be keeping the same time and the sun isn't going to be on the meridian for every spot in that rather wide geographical extent. The, the second thing that's uh, occurring here too though is that uh, we have the earth moving around the sun but it's not on a circular orbit it's on an elliptical orbit and there are times in fact when the sun is moving a little faster during the course of the day and night when we don't see it and a little slower and that effect changes through the course of the year and then also alters exactly what time on the clock the sun crosses uh, the local meridian or local noon. And then there's one more effect uh, that uh, is pretty easy to, to figure out when you think about it, and that's that we're on daylight saving time right now. We have jumped uh, the clocks ahead for daylight saving time, and that then just introduces another whole hour of difference to the timekeeping. So those three effects by themselves all change when exactly local noon occurs. But whenever local noon occurs, here at Griffith Observatory, that spot of sunlight gradually edges to the meridian arc. Now, the meridian arc is inscribed with the months of the year. They actually, if you, if you go all the way up to the top, they start way up there in January and continue all the way down here to June, and then they go back up again from July up to December on the far end. And there are a couple of special points marked, one very low down here, uh, which marks the time of summer solstice when the sun is very high and therefore, in fact, uh, sending a beam straight down or nearly straight down. And in winter, everybody knows, of course, in winter, the days are shorter, the nights are longer, and the sun crosses lower through the sky. And that means at local noon, the sun is going to be sending its image much higher up on the arc. And so there's a winter solstice point way up on the top. And in between, there is the equinox. And the equinox occurs twice, once in March and once in September. Equinox means equal night, and that just refers to the fact that at the equinoxes, the hours of daylight and the hours of night are practically equal. And, and so you have the same hours of day and night uh, around the globe just because of the configuration of the Earth in space and the axis' direction with respect to the sun at this time. Well, we've had the, the sun begin to encroach onto the meridian arc, the spot of sunlight is showing here. I can even see clouds moving across and it's brightening up, thank goodness, for a bit. And it's gradually moving closer and closer uh, to the uh, center line of the meridian arc. And as it's doing so, marking the date. Just a little off the position of the sun uh, is the 20th here. And so we are, of course, on the 22nd, uh, just a, a little bit farther uh, to the um, uh, the south from that and uh, the clouds are coming in and going out but you can see the earth turning before your very eyes as this image of the sun is moving closer and closer to the meridian arc and when it reaches the center it will in fact activate sensors so we don't just have a uh, old ancient medieval instrument here. This is for the 22nd century, well ahead of even our time, because the light from the sun, if it's bright enough, will activate the ecliptic chart over my head. 
and show where the sun is with respect to the stars that we can't even see in the sky as well as uh, those stars that are up there. And so all we're waiting now is to give the sun half a chance to shine and it's disappeared behind the clouds. Uh, so for the moment, it's high tension at Griffith Observatory. <laughs> it's kind of like Groundhog Day, you know? Will the sun come out and see its shadow? And in fact, if you look now on the equinox, up at the far left, oh, it went out again. Uh, and that's the clouds doing that. But those stars at the very end in Leo the Lion and the uh, spots on the ecliptic path that are at the far left end of the ecliptic chart, they lit for a moment and it'll take the sun just a little bit longer. The, the same equinox on the other side, uh, but the, and now they went out again because of the clouds. But in fact, in fact, I declare this a victory. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got some over there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, the 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 audience uh, ab above us here. The uh, center line and the proper stars and the position of the sun in Leo are still illuminated for the moment and the disk is still on the meridian arc gradually moving over farther and farther to the east uh, and soon yeah, they'll go off for good at this point we're no longer uh, sensing uh, any of the light from the sun but we have successfully passed local noon on the autumnal equinox and just about oh, 20, 25 minutes ago, we also actually passed the exact autumnal equinox at 12:20 uh, p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Uh, so one way or another, Griffith Observatory has continued to keep the Earth turning. Well, we appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Kropp, for bringing us that from the Gottlieb Transit Corridor and our Meridian Arc. And indeed, I did see the, the position of the sun light up. I saw Taurus appear several times. It came and went. So the sun put on a little bit of a, a drama, a bit of a dramatic moment there for us. But we certainly did manage to see our meridian arc in action. It did. The sun performed upon it as it's supposed to do. Um, so I hope all of you enjoyed that out there. And if you come to Griffith Observatory, remember astronomy, we are, we have to we put up with the weather. <laughs> you don't always get to have a clear day. So there have been folks that have come on their birthday to watch the sun perform upon our meridian arc on their very birthday. And it's cloudy. And they say, well, maybe I'll come back next year. Astronomers themselves, when we're given telescope time, we don't, we don't get to pick when that will be. We ask for time. It is uh, given to us. And then we go to the telescope or remote observe. And if it's cloudy, you try again next year is, is the way it goes. So we're very pleased that we got the sun to, to perform today. That is indeed a, a victory, um, unlike other days where it was raining for me out there on the equinox. So I'm very happy it was just partly cloudy. Patrick, uh, what are your feelings on today's equinox? I think it was very exciting. Um, each of these events that we've uh, streamed, uh, and, you know, starting with the winter um, uh, solstice through the March uh, equinox, and, and then the summer solstice, they, they all appear to be different. Today was a bit more variable with those clouds. Uh, it, was, it was interesting to see the clouds uh, cross um, in front of the sun um, on that meridian arc. And, and we did get a glimpse, of course, uh, uh, of the uh, ecliptic chart being uh, lit um, with the stars of Leo there. And then, you know, in fact, you know, it's, it's interesting that 
even though we can't see those stars, those stars are actually there, but the just the sun lights up our sky, makes it blue and washes out um, all those stars. So that's part of the sky that we don't see um, at this time of year. So it's very interesting to see that. Yeah, indeed. And some folks are commenting in the, the chat that it went black for just a moment. It did. Um, we did see the sun upon the upon the chart before we lost our video signal briefly from the transit corridor down on the, the western sunset terrace terrace down there, observatory, the cafe terrace. Um, but I think we, we did show it. If you're able to back up on the stream later, you'll be able to see those four lights that indicate the position of the sun light up. Um, looking at some of the other comments here a lot of folks are thanking us we thank you for joining us here today of course and appreciate all the enthusiasm that's out there that all of you are bringing to to this event it really is very special now tonight starting at 6 30 on this very same youtube channel patrick and i will be bringing you the presentation at sunset it turns out that in addition to the sun at local noon crossing our meridian arc at a specific point along the arc the sun sets at a specific direction tonight as well. And if you want to know what that is, well, you can go Google it, or you can join us tonight at 6.30 and see what that is all about. But what it comes down to is that all of this happens due to the celestial mechanics is the way to think about it. It's the celestial clockwork, the earth rotating around the sun, um, the other planets rotating around the sun. It all is happening because of gravity and physics, the way it all, it all happens. We can calculate this to very high degrees. This is why people throughout, throughout the ages have used the position of the sun and where it sets to track the time, to track the seasons, and to know when to do certain things, like have either some religious ceremonies, when to plant crops, when to take care of things that need to be done. So it all happens because of the way the earth is orbiting and the tilt of our axis. So we can build instruments to observe these things. And we've done that right here at Griffith Observatory. On our sunset lines, we have marked into the ground the direction the sun should set. So tonight is your chance to see, did we get it right? Did we get it wrong? Now we've always gotten it right all this time I've worked here at Griffith Observatory, but maybe something's happened. Maybe you're someone that believes that none of this is true. Well, you're going to come test it again and we'll see whether it ends up being correct or not. And then after we're done celebrating sunset, we have a special treat for you all. We are going to bring you live images from the Griffith Observatory Telescope. And I know that Venus has been out. I also know that Jupiter is that bright, bright object. I won't call it a star because it's not a star, it's a planet, but it's up there. It glows constantly. It's the brightest thing that's off in the east right after sunset, and it'll get high enough for us to observe before the end of the night. So if you can't join us exactly for sunset, come on back and tune in, and we'll have some beautiful images of night sky objects right here from Griffith Observatory. Yeah, indeed, Saturn is available too. We'll see how Saturn looks. It's a little further away, of course, if it provides a good view, if it, the air is stable, it's called the seeing. So if the air is extremely stable and we have a good view, we'll show you Saturn too. Um, we like to play the beautiful music from our Samuel Ocean Planetarium, just to keep everybody, you know, give everybody a beautiful moment where we can enjoy, really enjoy the view from our telescopes here at Griffith Observatory. Patrick, do you want to have any final thoughts before we close out our stream here today? No, I, I, I uh, you know, tonight's observing uh, will be a, quite a treat. Uh, we, we definitely will be uh, bringing you the brilliant planet Venus uh, telescopic view of it and uh, telescopic views of, of uh, Jupiter and its moons and uh, Saturn and its moons and, and, of course, Saturn and its rings. So we'll see how that looks. And it's all going to be streamed live uh, tonight uh, for your enjoyment. Yeah, that's the, it's going to be pretty exciting. This is based upon technology that we have been pioneering to bring events like eclipses to you. Um, and, and in fact, we've split that off and we've started bringing live images of the sun to school kids through our fifth grade school program. Our online school program is running right now for school kids throughout Southern California. They are able to virtually visit Griffith Observatory hear presentations and see videos that we've produced right here about our uh, solar devices, such as the uh, 
our sundial. I keep wanting to call it a sun time. It's the sundial that tells times by the motion of the sun. And our meridian arc, we tell the kids about that. We also give them a view through a solar telescope. It is a live presentation with live presenters. And it's, it's a three-part series, actually. The first part's all about observing. The second part is all about comets and we make a comment for the kids. And then the last part is about the search for water within our solar system, because water is very important. So if you like the idea that Griffith Observatory is able to expose kids to that sort of material and to bring these sort of presentations to you using the same sort of technologies that we're using for those kids, join our foundation. You'll have access to even more exciting presentations. You'll be able to help Griffith Observatory do what we do and uh, continue to bring these wonderful events. So. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, Griffith Observatory owns and operates Griffith Observatory. The city of Los Angeles owns and operates Griffith Observatory. Griffith Observatory has brought you this presentation today. And the city of Los Angeles um, is very proud to bring a facility like this to you. And if you like it, again, join the Griffith Observatory Foundation. They are our non nonprofit partner in all that we do. So thank you very much. And we'll see you all tonight.